Hey there, Otaku. Are you ready to see one of the largest, if not the largest, collection of video game consoles that are plugged in and readily playable on the internet today? Stop by in February. I'll be counting down all of my systems right here on Go Mega Otaku Gamer Alpha. You'll get to see them all. You'll get to see your favorites. You'll get to see ones you've never even heard of. Check out my massive collection coming in February. Hey there, Otaku. Ken Chan back with another episode of Go Mega Otaku Gamer Alpha. Um, and uh, I want to show you something. Here, let's let's have a look at this. Okay. This is a copy of 99er Home Computer from August 1983. I don't know if you can see that there. But... Uh, this magazine is a computer magazine. It's about the TI-99 4A. Um, it was uh, around in the early 80s, expand into the future. And what was cool about magazines like this and, and, uh, is the fact that um, they had programs in them. Now here's some letters to the editor. Graphic, oh crap. But uh, as we flip through here, we will start to come, we will come here to a, actually more than just one, there's several of these in here, in any given one of these older magazines. If you remember, if you think back and you remember these older magazines, you have programs here um, that are typed up, and the idea is you copy the program into your computer, and then you, of course, save it to a disk drive or uh, to a cassette. Here's a big one. To a cassette drive. This is what? Jungle Gym. And it goes on and on and on. And then it says continued on page 42. And you go over to page 42. And it keeps going. But anyway, uh, I collect these old magazines. Not as heavily, of course, as I collect. The, the consoles and the, and, the, and the games. But, uh, you know, I still have a bunch of these, too, as well. They're, they're interesting. Um, you know, this, go, this, this programming stuff goes on. Uh, they're interesting to, to have around uh, because you get to look back at advertisements for things that are just ridiculous and completely obsolete. Um, like, like this Signalman Mark III modem here that they're advertising uh, for a hundred dollars uh, it probably doesn't even you know <laughs> it's, it's a direct connect modem you know it's um, ridiculous but uh, that's back when they had like they measured the stuff in baud rate or whatever um, <clears throat> but anyway looking through these things you can get it you, you get a real taste you know of the past and if if you're one of those people that grew up on like uh, NES and things like that you weren't around for the days of the original home computers which as I have stated in previous episodes did nothing I mean they really did nothing oh look here's a here's a munchman cake that somebody made you know, munchman but uh, anyway this is all leading someplace and where it is leading is the machine that we're going to look at today, of course, is going to be the TI-99 4A. And this is the TI-99 4A home computer. And the 
this one has the speech synthesizer on it, which we'll talk about here. Okay, now the uh, TI-99 4A, of course, was a home computer. It was released in June of 1981. It was discontinued in October of 1983. Uh, the operating system was TI Basic. The CPU was a TI TMS 9900 at 3.0 MHz. The memory was 256 bytes scratch pad RAM and 16 kilobytes of VDP graphics RAM. Okay, the machine itself was actually the the the, the, the uh, TMS9900 um, CPU was actually a 16-bit 64-pin DIP. It was a 16-bit processor, um, which is uh, you know so basically what it was was an early 16-bit computer. Uh, in my opinion, the machine itself would have made a fantastic game console, never mind the computer part. 16-bit um, console at a time when everybody else was using 8-bit. Uh, the graphics on this were quite good. There was two, two models. Uh, there was the silver and then there was the white. I have the silver. Um, and let's take a look at that silver. Okay, right here we go. Um... Let's start over here on this end. This is the speech synthesizer. This is a separate peripheral, okay, um, which comes out. That's what this is. Uh, for all you folks that are, uh, you know, a little, little younger that um, maybe cuts your teeth on something like a, uh, a, a an NES or even a Super NES, uh, back in the day, before they had you know, voice capabilities in, in machines, you had to have an add-on that did it separately. And there were several other machines at this time that used an add-on. Um, the Odyssey 2 had had a voice. The Intellivision had the Intellivoice. It's a module that plugs into it somewhere. You know, it's a memory expansion thing, and, and it, it plugs into it, and it provides, you know, a talking voice. Um, and, of course, it plugs into the side here, into this memory expansion port. Uh, there are some games that use this port too, because the port, um, the, the the memory in the game is is so large, it needs memory expansion. It needs this port. And this is the game slot here, and in here I have Parsec, which also utilizes Mr. Speech Synthesizer here. And this is what the cartridges look like. Um, just, you know, your your typical cartridge, nothing spectacular. Uh, the shape is kind of squirrely when you try to put them in a drawer or stack them up because you have this lip right here and, and they don't, you know, if you try to stack something like that, they all fall over because they all end up leaning in one direction. But, uh, you know, that's the cartridge port here. Full-blown QWERTY keyboard. QWERTY. Okay, um, and as you can see here, this one's a little bit scratchy. It's seen some better days, but it is functional. Uh, we have on the front here, you have, of course, here's the on-off switch right here. This turns it on and off. Right now it's in an off position. It's unplugged anyway. Nothing else really on the front there. On the side here is a key, is the, um, yeah, the, the controller port, which I have the controllers plugged into. The controllers share a port, and these are the controllers here. Um, and, and for the time, you know, they're a joystick controller. They're light. Um, they handle pretty well. This button is kind of sticky, tough type thing. You know, it doesn't click. It doesn't offer any kind of, you know, resistance or pushback. But for the, you know, for the most part, a pretty functional uh, joystick. Uh, I actually like this probably a little bit better than other joysticks that were around at the time, like the Atari joystick which was quite difficult. This one's a little bit easier to to move around. Then you come on to the back here and this is where the this is where your uh, yeah, your your TV signal is. It's proprietary. It goes out to the television there. Bunch of cooling here. Here we have the power and here we have another port. Not sure what this is for. Uh, you can't plug joysticks in here. Maybe you can plug uh, two more joysticks in here for four player. I'm not exactly sure. I've never used it. Um, and of course, we talked about that port. And this is the machine here. Um, 
quite quite a neat machine uh, quite uh, well well to do and we're gonna we're gonna go ahead and look at the games and we'll look at the graphics on these games and you'll see what I'm talking about when I say that this machine is would, would have been better suited probably as, as a game console at the time than a computer um, despite the fact that the, the when this was out the the, the home gaming uh, market was crashing um, they, they might have wanted to have waited maybe and come out with a 16-bit game console with this but uh, we're gonna go ahead and take a look at the games now okay otaku let's fire this thing up and you'll hear probably a little bit of uh, like an RF buzz that's something it can't be helped uh, this connection cable is very old and of course this machine is old so you're gonna have a little bit of a wah, 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 thing going on there but uh, that's perfectly okay and it says ready press any key to begin you press a key if you press one you go into TI basic and you can program the thing um, right now we have parsec in the slot so we press two for parsec and of course it's press any key to begin I don't want to turn this up too loud because it'll buzz right in your ear. But maybe you can hear the the little the voice from the voice synthesizer. Kind of looks like Defender. Now, on many of these old machines, you can switch from channel 2 or 3 or 4. Usually 2 or 3 or 3 or 4. With a switch that's on the module itself. Uh, on this machine, the, the switch is on the RF box. And it's a big RF box that comes with this. But these graphics are very clean. Despite the fact that it's a little old and has, whoops, it has some buzz to it. It's still very clean graphics. Ugh. Uh. And that's Parsec. Okay, we're going to press 2 for a little munch man here. <laughs> What's this a knockoff of? Can you guess? Yeah, it's a Pac-Man knockoff. It's a little different, though. You got a maze, and you got four little thingies chasing you. But the object of the game is you're actually leaving something behind rather than eating, you know, eating something and removing it. Now, the neat thing is the, the power dots are replaced by little... <laughs> by little uh, images of Texas. God help us all. Whoa. But, uh... And that flash, and in between the flashing, and they say T.I. You know, which is critical. See, what you're doing is you're building this chain all over the... And there's a clear screen right there. How about that? Munchman. Okay. Little TI invaders for you. What's this look like?
I said, this probably looks more like Space Invaders than what they had on Atari. If you want to get right down to it. Ooh. Huh. Ooh. Uh-huh, but there you see it. <laughs> you wouldn't have believed it otherwise, really. TI Invaders. I guess they're only going to invade Texas. And here we go with a not-so-common version of Donkey Kong. Found on the TI. Doesn't look bad. This looks way better than just about any of the uh, machine, the uh, game console machine versions of this that I've ever seen. Way better. You know, well, I mean, at this point, and even after this point, hell, this looks better than uh, probably than the uh, NES version, as far as I'm concerned. Except for the fact that the ape doesn't move. Uh, I don't know how the hell you're supposed to get that hammer way out there. But anyway, you get the idea. Not a bad looking version of Donkey Kong at all. Probably quite a, quite a good version. Good looking version of Donkey Kong. Uh, one more thing I want to show you here. If you'll take a look at. Uh, this here is Minor 2049er for the TI-99 4A. And as I said, it plugs into this slot on the side of the computer. This does not go where the other games go. You can see this thing here. There's no way that you'd be able to put this in the front of that thing with this with this, you know, lip hanging here like this. Um, this goes in the side of the machine where the um, voice module was. And the voice module itself has another port on the side that runs through that you could plug this into as well. And then you have a nice mess sticking out the side of the machine. Um, I have the box for this as well, um, but that's sealed away. Uh, these are not common. Yeah, the TI-99 4A at the end of the day probably would have made a better game console than a computer. Uh, everybody was going computer at that point, though, because the game consoles were really pretty much dead. Uh, it's a shame that uh, Texas Instruments didn't get in on the game sooner and turn this into a, 
you know, a game console earlier on versus waiting and making a computer out of it. This is a 16-bit computer. Um, it looks, it, lo it really does look better, um, in my opinion. Uh, I really think that it does. Um, and, of course, uh, programming the thing was a lot of fun. There was a lot of perifs that they had for it. I don't, the, I, I don't have the disk drive. Uh, the disk drive was bigger than the computer itself, uh, quite large, and it's, I think it was, uh, in fact, if I remember correctly, it's so large you could sit a monitor on top of it. Um, a lot of it's hollow. The actual disk drive itself is, you know, just a small percentage of the overall chassis, you know, it's a big chassis. But, uh, quite an interesting machine. And there was a, there were a lot of users using it, which you know you saw that magazine that I showed you at the beginning of the episode. Um, there were people subscribing to that and buying a lot of those peripherals and things like that. They had modems, they had uh, printers. Uh, I, I recommend this machine to anyone who likes retro gaming with good graphics. Uh, if you can find one and you can find games for it, I would recommend picking it up. Really. Uh, uh, it's not just for hardcore collectors. The games look good. They play well. Um, and if you find one, you're probably going to find it cheap. And if you find the games, you're probably going to find those cheap. So you can get yourself a half-decent, you know, gaming module, really, from that era, for pretty cheap. So if you just like to play a lot of games, the, here's a quick, easy way to do it. Um, if you, if you can find one. Um, they're not they're not really all that hard to find. They're not common, but they're not really super rare. I, I wouldn't go out of my way to look around for one to try to find one. But if you find one, you come across one at a yard sale or at a flea market or something, it's worth picking up. It really is. Um, especially if you can get some games with it. You know, if, uh, if somebody's selling off like a, a Texas Instruments TI-99 and they have, uh, you know, like 10 games with it or something like that, and they want like you know 40 50 bucks or even less maybe 20 bucks you know, it depends depends on who has it i would recommend picking it up because uh they're a lot of fun uh the and the games really do look good on it so that being said i do recommend it for anyone that is interested in collecting on any level um it's it's not necessarily a staple but it's a good gaming machine I recommend it. It's the TI-99-4A from Texas Instruments.